Good morning and welcome to our webinar. Our speaker today is Dr. Ben Miller. He joined Catan in 2016 from Peter Crozier's group at Arizona State University and has a background both in catalysis research and in situ TEM. Ben's responsibilities at Catan include proposing and testing new products during development, demonstrating and training customers on Gatan products, and developing new and better workflows for in situ microscopy. In this role, Ben routinely helps customers learn new products and to get the most out of the data that they collect. In the webinar today, Ben will share from his experience and describe the new time-resolved acquisition modes that we've been developing for our continuum energy filter. These in situ capabilities provide versatility in experiment design and data collection. Ben will also show several data processing features and how they've been adapted to handle in situ EELS data sets. In addition to this webinar, we've made several other resources available, and Ben will provide more information and links to these at the end of the talk. As always, we welcome your questions, and there will be a short Q&A session after Ben's presentation. The GoToWebinar interface provides a questions pane. Please use this interface to submit any questions you might have during the webinar. We'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A, but anything we don't get to, we'll answer via direct email to you after the webinar concludes. And now, I'll hand it over to Ben. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Uh, I'm excited uh, to present this webinar today and uh, to show the the result of a lot of the hard work that we've been doing. <coughs> um, and uh, I I hope that you all are excited about the the potential for new experiments and the the sorts of things uh, that you could do uh, with this new instrumentation. Uh, before I get to the details of the continuum, uh, I want to do a brief introduction to in situ. Uh, and uh, I apologize if you've seen me present uh, this same, essentially the same introduction before. Uh, but I want to talk about in situ TEM and what that is, and also what do I mean by a, an in situ GATAN product. So in situ TEM uh, really means that we're observing the sample while applying some sort of stimulus to the material. Uh, so that can be any uh, combination of various stimuli, uh, and I have some examples here uh, in the diagram on the left. And then we want to observe the sample during that uh, applying that stimulus. And so this could be imaging, but it could also be spectroscopy uh, that you're performing during the in situ stimulus. Um, now, when I talk about a GATAN in situ or IS product, uh, I mean something slightly different. Uh, I don't mean that we're applying a stimulus with our, our camera, uh, but rather that we're acquiring uh, time-resolved data, that this in-situ product enables time-resolved data to be acquired. And this is not just limited to TEM imaging anymore. We've had uh, a number of cameras, which you can see here on the, the right, uh, the Rio IS, OneView IS, K2, and K3 IS. Uh, but now we're expanding this also to our uh, spectrometers and energy filters so that we now have a continuum IS. Um, I, I want to show an example here to demonstrate why in situ acquisition is so important, uh, why it's important to observe the sample during stimulus and why it's important to uh, continuously acquire data. Uh, and this is a, a really nice video uh, captured by some researchers at the Fritz Haber Institute uh, in Germany. And you can see at the top right uh, this particle that's uh, doing something really quite dynamic. Uh, this is at high temperature in a gas environment. And uh, the environment is not changing here. Uh, it's a nominally static environment. Uh, but you can see a lot of, of dynamic processes are taking place 
in this catalyst sample. Uh, and so this is really interesting and, and some really nice work uh, and a lot of analysis could be done here. But what I want to point out specifically in this video is that a before and after uh, observation is not sufficient, uh, certainly not in this case. And for many in situ experiments, this is true. Uh, you know, if we had, if these researchers had captured an image uh, of the initial state of the material and then applied some stimulus and then took an image after, uh, that stimulus was finished, uh, they would see a change in this material. They would see, uh, maybe they would study the uh, change in morphology or the change in particle size or the change in position, uh, or maybe even uh, surface facets and the distribution of, of different surfaces on this particle. And you could do a lot of detailed uh, analysis here, but I guarantee, that without in situ experiments, without observing this during the stimulus, these researchers would never guess uh, that this is what happened in between those two end states. Uh, so in situ experiments are, are really essential uh, in many cases to really understand not only what is the, uh, the behavior of the material before and after, some uh, real world condition, but during that uh, that condition in the microscope, uh, seeing what's really happening under conditions that mimic the real world. And so this is why in situ experiments in the microscope are, are so valuable and why it's so important to be able to capture data continuously. Uh, so now I'll move on to uh, talk a bit about the continuum IS and exactly what we enable with the continuum. Uh, this is the newest addition to our list of in situ products at Gatan. Um, but before I talk about all the different types of data that can be acquired with the continuum, I want to, uh, to make a note here and, and uh, a bit of a caveat that some of the features that I'm going to show today are, um, are only available if you purchase options for the continuum. So a base continuum does not come with any of the in situ continuous acquisition features that I'm going to show today. Um, and also doesn't come with the K3 or, or with StemX. Uh, so these are things that are optional, and uh, it's, uh, I think, important for me to just note this uh, so that uh, you all are aware if you are uh, in the process of purchasing a continuum or, or you uh, will be doing so in the next uh, year or two, um, just keep this in mind, and, and this is what uh, our sales people, uh, one of the things that they will help you with is to make sure that you are including all the correct options uh, to do the sorts of experiments that you want to do. Um, but I'm going to talk about the system uh, as if it had all of these options available. Uh, and mostly, specifically, the, the in situ option. Uh, so with this one system, this continuum IS, um, there are a number of different acquisition modes. And so we can, uh, of course, we can collect eel spectra, uh, as you would expect from a spectrometer, but we can also collect TEM images. Uh, with the, the camera at the end of the energy filter. Um, we can collect energy filtered TEM images uh, since the camera is at the end of the GIF. Uh, we can collect diffraction uh, or, or better yet filtered diffraction uh, where a lot of the uh, inelastic scattering has been removed. Uh, from the diffraction pattern. We can collect stem images uh, because the spectrometer can come with its own stem detector. 
and we can collect eel spectra, of course, and spectrum images as well, uh, like maps, eels maps and line scans. Um, we can, with the, uh, with the Q slit option, we can collect momentum resolved eels, uh, where you get a, a two dimensional uh, image rather than a one dimensional spectra. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into much detail about that today, but that's an option. And also 4D STEM, uh, which is uh, a really, um, popular and growing technique these days uh, that is is really a, a number of techniques uh, in in uh, where you can acquire your data and then do all types of different processing uh, to get a lot of really interesting information from your sample and that you can do with a continuum if you purchase the uh, stemx option and uh, this is, I think, uh, this versatility is one of the, the really exciting things about the continuum and the continuum IS uh, especially, um, that uh, especially for labs where you uh, have a user facility or, or you have a, a number of different users with really diverse requirements, um, all of them, all of those users can most likely benefit uh, from this instrumentation and, uh, and really improve the, the quality of the results that uh, people can get for any number of different experiments. Uh, and so this, this versatility is really one of the things I'm most excited about for the continuum. Uh, and then, a lot of these acquisition modes, uh, most of them with the IS option for the continuum are now designed for time resolved data acquisition. Uh, so a number of these, there, there were ways that you could, um, you could do time resolved acquisition in the past, maybe something manual or screen captures, or there were, there were ways that you could uh, put something together, but now almost all of these are really designed from the ground up for time resolved data acquisition. So not only can we acquire TM images, but we can acquire TM videos uh, or energy filtered videos um, with the, the caveat here that we don't do background subtraction during a video. Um, we can do diffraction videos or filtered diffraction videos. Uh, and I'll show examples of, of each of these in the coming slides. Um, and with all of these, uh, you can do this time resolved acquisition with the same uh, software interface uh, that you are used to in GMS. And I want to give just one example of that here. Uh, showing this new uh, STEM video acquisition mode uh, that we've added, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about it in a future slide. Uh, but just want to point out the, the way that the interface works here, where we have this in situ toggle at the top of our technique. Uh, and when I click this in situ toggle, now I have this record button uh, that's available. And uh, so uh, this, this is true for the camera, it's true for STEM, uh, and it's also true for eels as well. Uh, that now in addition to capturing a single uh, acquisition, a single image or spectrum, we can continuously record data uh, to disk in real time uh, for an, an indefinite amount of time. Uh, also, a, a number of these uh, capabilities, these different acquisition modes can be uh, done now in uh, accounted uh, acquisition mode if you're using the K3. Uh, so the only one that that doesn't apply to is STEM since we're using a STEM detector and not a camera. Uh, but for all of these other techniques, these can be uh, counted uh, using a counted acquisition mode 
if you have the K3 uh, option for the continuum. And that's one uh, that I, I highly recommend. Uh, it's, it really uh, decreases the amount of noise uh, in your data and um, gives you the, the very best uh, results uh, when you're operating the, the K3 and counted mode. Okay, so now I'm going to show a series of slides uh, just with some example data uh, showing all of these different modes. And, and in each case, I'm going to be looking at the exact same sample. Um, so this is a, a tin nanoparticle sample. Uh, and you can see around the, the edge of the particle some oxide that's formed in situ as well. Uh, and we'll see that a bit later also, but, um, but this is a tin nanoparticle sample and I'm heating and cooling this uh, tin uh, nanoparticle uh, above and below its melting point. So it melts and recrystallizes, melts and recrystallizes. Uh, and oops, sorry, let me go back and play this video again. Um, and so we can we can see the the dynamic changes that are happening as this uh, material melts and recrystallizes. And of course, in certain modes, uh, this is uh, provides a much more dramatic uh, change, like in in dark field. Um, but we can do bright field TM imaging, dark field TM imaging, uh, zero loss filtering to remove inelastically scattered electrons or, or energy filtered imaging, all on the same camera, all very easily on the same uh, day and, and in the same experiment. Uh, and in fact, switching between uh, the different modes on the spectrometer, the, the uh, standard TEM or filtered, zero loss filtered or energy filtered, this switching is, is incredibly easy and fast. Uh, so I'm showing that in this next video uh, where I start off in f then switch the spectrometer to zero loss filtering, uh, and then uh, remove the, the slit on the spectrometer entirely to go to standard TEM, then back to zero loss, and finally back to f -tem. And all of this uh, is just one single acquisition with the camera. So I start in my video acquisition and then just switch the spectrometer uh, during acquisition. And uh, I, I haven't deleted anything or cut anything. Um, this is just uh, the way that, that the data looks after I've acquired it continuously. So this switching is, is really fast and really easy. Um, and uh, here in FTEM, it's, it's kind of interesting. We can actually see some spots in the FFT. Uh, and the, the data quality is really quite nice. Uh, and this is just showing what this looks like after I've summed a number of frames in, in this FTEM mode. Uh, now on to diffraction. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we can do diffraction and filtered diffraction. Uh, here I'm showing on the left uh, um, selected area electron diffraction where we have small spots. And then here in the middle and on the right, I'm doing uh, convergent beam electron diffraction. Uh, and in all cases, uh, not uh, using any beam stop and putting the, the direct beam directly on the camera. Um, and uh, so this this is uh, a really nice uh, capability of the camera that it, it really does quite well for diffraction. Uh, and with the IS option, we can capture these diffraction videos as well. Uh, so this is uh, a really nice capability. And the ability to filter the diffraction pattern because the camera is at the end of the energy filter uh, is, is quite nice. You reduce a lot of the sort of haze that you would normally see from the inelastic scattering uh, in the sample. Uh, and again, this, this is the same experiment where I'm heating and cooling the sample. And so you're seeing melting and recrystallization of this nanoparticle sample. 
Uh, here is uh, some STEM imaging, STEM video. Uh, it's rather quick. I'll play these again. Uh, and I, I don't know if you noticed the first time around, but some of these particles are, are flashing rather brightly. That's when they crystallize. Uh, but what I, what I want to emphasize here uh, is that I'm not just uh, capturing what's on the screen. I'm not doing a screen capture here uh, to collect this STEM video. I'm actually collecting what I would call real data uh, with the full dynamic range of the STEM detector. Uh, so uh, these two videos are actually the same video, uh, and I'm just uh, changing the contrast limits of my uh, display in GMS. And uh, so this is something that I can now do because we, in GMS 3.5, we're now enabling STEM video acquisition. Um, and uh, so we can see that in this area that in, in the sort of standard uh, contrast, we, we just see black and it, it looks like it, there's nothing there. It's just the background. Uh, if we change the contrast in the image, uh, we actually see some of this uh, oxide that's formed around these particles um, that we we would miss completely if we were just capturing a stem video by recording the screen. Uh, and so this is, um, I mean, STEM video is is hardly a, a fantastic technological breakthrough. Um, <laughs> it's the sort of thing that I, I'm surprised we didn't have 10 years ago. Um, but now we're, we're finally adding this capability to, to really properly collect uh, STEM video. Um, and this is very similar to the way that we collect uh, data with our cameras, our in-situ cameras, uh, including features like look back uh, and playing back the data with the in-situ player. Uh, of course, the spectrometer can also do uh, stem eels and, and mapping uh, like all continuum systems. And uh, so we, because the, the spectrometer is very fast, uh, we can collect quite large maps uh, rather quickly. Uh, so this map uh, has over 130,000 eel spectra, and this was dual eels. Uh, so it's, it's really twice that many. Uh, and this was captured in, in just over three minutes. Uh, so it's quite fast. This is the one uh, piece of data in my presentation that's not time resolved. And that's because uh, at the moment in our software interface, we don't have time resolved spectrum imaging implemented. Uh, and you may have seen a, a note about that on, on my previous slide. Uh, so if you are interested in doing mapping uh, over time and, and uh, collecting a, an entire series of maps uh, during your in-situ experiment, uh, please contact us, uh, let me know. There, there are ways to collect this data if you are determined enough. Um, you can collect this in a, a time-resolved way, but the, the really built-in, simple, easy-to-use functionality is not yet implemented in our software. Uh, however, we do now have some really nice, uh, easy to use functionality for continuously collecting EELS data. Um, so this now works just like uh, the way that we would collect a TEM video. We can now collect uh, what I like to call an EELS video. Um, and so we can uh, we can use look back uh, for this as well, where uh, after you see some change in the spectrum, then you can click record and you have a buffer of time before you clicked uh, that's already saved. And so you don't miss that onset. Uh, that's now available for this in situ eels. And we can collect data indefinitely uh, and until you say to stop. 
uh, and we can do this at the highest speed. And so uh, I'll talk a bit more later about uh, processing. You can see here that I'm fitting my eels data uh, with uh, a, Gaussian, a couple of Gaussian peaks. Um, I'll, I'll talk more later about the, the various processing that we can do with this data. Uh, but this again is this tin uh, sample that I'm melting and recrystallizing by changing the temperature. And uh, so you can see here on the left, I've just zoomed in to, to the tin plasmon peak and the fit that I'm doing. Uh, there. And so uh, you can see that this plasmon peak moves uh, quite a lot. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> quite a lot, but, you know, point, uh, point 0.3 EV. Um, but it, it's certainly uh, a visible change. And uh, I'm, I'm doing this fitting live during the playback here on the left. But I can also just click uh, one button and have the software uh, map out this fit over the entire in situ uh, acquisition. And so that's what you see at the bottom right here. Uh, is the plasmon peak energy uh, during this entire uh, in situ acquisition. Uh, and at the top, you also see the, the measured holder temperature. Uh, and this graph is generated uh, automatically as I collect my data. Uh, and that's because I'm controlling this holder through our software. So in this case, this was a, a dense solutions heating holder. Uh, but this could also, uh, this would also work with uh, one of our GATAN heating holders or cooling holders. Uh, anytime that we're controlling the temperature, uh, we are generating a plot like this whenever I collect uh, my EELS data or, or uh, TEM video. And so this makes it really easy for me to go back and, and uh, correlate these two. And so I can look, uh, for example, at the points where this plasmon uh, peak energy drops uh, dramatically. And I can see that this is actually the exact same temperature uh, in each of these um, uh, each of these cycles. And so uh, this is the melting temperature of this uh, tin nanoparticle. And then uh, I recrystallize actually at a much lower temperature. Um, but again, actually quite a consistent uh, temperature here that, that uh, the recrystallization happens at. Uh, and so this is, is quite nice and quite easy, uh, really, to do this analysis. Uh, this entire thing probably took me five, ten minutes um, after the data was collected. So uh, processing and visualizing data. I, I do want to talk about this a bit because uh, this is essential. Um, I, I like to uh, remind people that data on a hard drive is no more useful than the atoms in your sample. Uh, you can't see data on your hard drive uh, any more than you can see the atoms in your sample. So it's important not just to collect data, uh, but to visualize that data. Uh, in a useful way and, and most likely to process that data uh, in a way that brings out uh, the, the really most relevant features of your data. Uh, so this is really just as important as acquiring the data. You, you have to be able to process and visualize it. And we provide uh, the in-situ player. This is a, a free part of digital micrograph. Uh, it's been free for years, and it works with uh, K2 and K3IS, OneViewIS, RioIS, and now it works also with ContinuumIS, um, uh, in including the STEM video data, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and we've recently updated the user interface uh, for the in-situ player and uh, made it, I hope, much more intuitive. Uh, and also added a few features uh, to the IS player. Um, the uh, functionality here, there's a lot of things that 
that the IS player uh, is designed to do. But most importantly, of course, visualization, being able to play back your data. And this is really optimized for large data sets. Um, and so uh, even if your data is hundreds of gigabytes, uh, which is not, uh, in fact, very difficult with uh, one of the modern uh, fast uh, CMOS cameras that we sell, um, it's very easy to collect tens or even hundreds of gigabytes, but it's also very easy to open that data and to play it back with the in-situ player. Uh, and you don't need a supercomputer to do this. You can use the in-situ player even on a laptop uh, quite easily. And it's, it's designed specifically for that. Uh, it does processing live. Uh, so as I apply, different processing methods using this in-situ editor that's uh, reflected live in the data as it's played back. Um, one of the primary features of the in-situ player is to reduce the amount of data. And we can do this on a number of different dimensions. So we can reduce the, the spatial extent of the data using uh, cropping. We can reduce the spatial resolution by binning. We can reduce the, the temporal duration uh, by cropping in time or the temporal resolution by combining frames. Uh, and all of this is, is very easy to do. Um, we can also drift correct uh, the data, whether uh, that's uh, from our cameras or, or from a uh, stem detector. Uh, we can do this with an optional filtering step uh, to improve the, the drift correction. Uh, and we can do this either on the full image uh, or just tracking a single feature in the image, uh, which is really valuable, especially if you have uh, multiple particles, for example, that are moving in different directions, um, that you can track just one of those. Uh, we, we now have a new feature Oops, of uh, a new feature of spatial filtering uh, where we can do bandpass filters to reduce the noise in your data or uh, Laplace or Sobel filters, uh, for example, to uh, detect edges. Uh, and, and all different combinations of these filters can be applied to very easily to every frame in the in-situ data set. Uh, so that's new. Uh, and of course, we can export this data uh, either as a, an MP4 video or uh, an IS data set uh, so that you can continue to do quantitative uh, processing and analysis of your data. Uh, or we can now, uh, and this is also a new feature, export the in-situ data sets, not as a movie, but as a series of individual images, either in uh, DM format or as TIFFs. Um, and so all of these, uh, again, are free. This is freely available on our website, and I'll, I'll mention that again in a few minutes. Um, there are a lot of uh, processing features for eels in GMS. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with collecting and processing eels data, uh, there's a whole number of features uh, that you can use. And we've now uh, modified and, and done all the hard work behind the scenes to make this compatible with the new uh, in-situ time-resolved eels data. And so all of these uh, processing features now work uh, with our new in-situ data uh, format for eels. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all of these in detail here, but I, I want to point out that the ones in blue here I'll be demonstrating uh, in a, a pre-recorded video on the next slide. Uh, so here in this video, I'm going to show uh, processing of an in-situ data set. This is uh, a different sample. Uh, this is the one data set uh, in my presentation that's not tin. This is aluminum. Uh, but here I'm just playing back through the data with the IS player. And you can see this is a dual EELS data set. So we have both the low loss, which has a zero loss peak, and uh, quote unquote high loss, which in this case is still the low loss region of the spectrum uh, where I have the plasmon peak. Uh, 
And so the first thing I'm going to do is to align my data by the zero loss peak. Uh, this is why I, it's so important uh, for this experiment to have the zero loss peak is I can align my data and this will also align the, uh, the high loss part of the, the dual eels data set. So now my data is aligned. Um, and I can again uh, play that back. I can also splice uh, those two pieces of data together. Uh, and so I'm going to do that. Uh, and uh, I can simultaneously, while I'm splicing, I'm also going to sum together every 10 spectra uh, so that I have uh, better signal to noise and fewer spectra in my spliced data set. Uh, so now I can play this back uh, again, my spliced data. And that looks good. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to fit this data using the nonlinear least squares fitting uh, uh, palette in GMS. And instead of doing this all manually, I, I already have uh, a whole a recipe for this that's uh, preloaded, and I just open that up, and and so now I'm fitting uh, these different peaks uh, all simultaneously. And as I play this back uh, with the IS player, you can see that that fit is updating live. And then if I click map, uh, I can now do this fit for every uh, spectra in this in situ data set. So I'll just keep all the defaults there and click OK. And so now it's gone through and done this fit. And the thing that I'm most interested in for this particular experiment is the position of the aluminum plasmon peak. Uh, so that's what I'm showing here. And uh, I, I'm interested in this plasmon peak position because this can be correlated to temperature. And so I have a Python script that I've run now to convert the eels, um, the, the plasmon peak position to a temperature. And now I can go on and, and export uh, this data to uh, an MP4 video, uh, like the one that I showed earlier in this uh, PowerPoint. And so this is the way that I produce that video is uh, just using the, the in-situ player and editor. I can just click export as a video. Um, and uh, here I can change the name. I can set the frame rate for the, the video. And uh, also I'm adding a timestamp uh, to the bottom right of the, the uh, MP4 video. So I'll click OK. And now this is going to go through and uh, save every spectra in this data set as a frame in my uh, MP4 video. And because I'm fitting the data with the nonlinear least squares fitting, that will also be included in my video. Uh, so that's great for, for PowerPoint presentations. Uh, and we can play this back, of course, with anything that can play an MP4 video. So, uh, so that's, that's quite, uh, quite nice, makes this very easy. There are ways to, to sort of kludge something together in the past uh, to do something similar to this, but now this is, GMS is really designed to do this. Uh, now I'm going to show how we can create a cascade plot. Uh, so if you're um, writing a, a publication and, and this needs to become a, a document, uh, a video is not going to be so useful. Um, but we also have the capability now in GMS to produce a cascade plot. Uh, so I'll show that here. Um, and in this case, what I'm really interested in, again, is the position of this plasmon peak. And so I'll zoom in on this plasmon peak and uh, make it so that we can see this really quite subtle uh, change in the position here of only about 0.2 EV. Uh, but we can see that uh, quite nicely using this uh, type of visualization. 
and uh, yeah, this is this is fairly new in GMS that so we can do this type of uh, cascade plot for publications. All right, uh, so now just in, in the last few slides here, I'm going to, to uh, just point you to some additional resources um, that we already have uh, on our website and on YouTube. So if you're interested in the in-situ player, uh, which is free and you can download today, um, here is a link to uh, the instructions. You can see uh, on the right side here um, what our website looks like. And uh, you can, uh, if you select this IS cameras license, then you can use the in-situ player for free uh, on, uh, on your own computer. Uh, we have a number of resources now available for helping you to get the most out of the IS player. So I presented an entire webinar on just on the IS player uh, several months ago. So if you didn't see that already, uh, you can go to YouTube uh, at this link and see uh, this webinar that's all about the IS player and how we can use it. Uh, to do all the things that I very briefly described today. And one of the things that I show in my webinar is this data set, which is a dark field, uh, dark field video of this same uh, tin sample where uh, I show how I aligned this data, uh, which is a bit tricky given all the, the contrast changes in this sample. Um, but I, I show in this webinar how I align that. We are also working on a number of short tutorial videos uh, that are just a few minutes each uh, that are going up on YouTube. Uh, so four of these are already available and you can see them uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, the rest of these, I hope that we'll be able to get out by the end of this year. Um, but we're, we're still working on producing uh, those uh, additional tutorial videos. Um, so if, if you're stuck or, or you just want to learn more about how the, the player and editor work, uh, you can take a look at those videos. Um, of course, we can't possibly uh, build into our software every type of uh, processing or visualization or, or um, analysis that you might want to do. Uh, we do try to, uh, to write software that enables you to really easily do standard techniques. Uh, but there's a vast spectrum of techniques and applications out there and researchers, uh, maybe including you yourself, are, are constantly developing new methods, uh, new methodologies that are tailored to a specific experiment or, or to specific conclusions that, that maybe no one has tried to uh, achieve before. And so uh, scripting in GMS really provides that infinite flexibility uh, that's needed sometimes uh, to process and analyze uh, data. And so I, I just want to show uh, some resources for scripting uh, that we've made available. So uh, you can watch uh, a webinar video like this one on DM scripting or uh, go to a web page uh, where we have a number of resources for DM scripting. Uh, and also Python scripting. Uh, here are a couple of, of videos, a short one about how to install GMS with Python, and then an entire webinar, again, uh, like this one that I presented earlier this year, uh, explaining uh, in more detail about what we can do with Python and GMS. Uh, and then finally, an entire uh, website that has a number of resources, including these, um, for Python scripting. And 
if you if you haven't uh, been able to uh, take a screenshot or write down these links, uh, don't worry. This webinar, uh, like all of our webinars, will be available on our website and on YouTube in a few days. Uh, so you can come back and, and refer back to these resources. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll conclude here, um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to answer some of the questions uh, that you might have uh, if you've written in questions already, or you can write in uh, questions right now, and we'll, we'll try to answer as many of those as possible. All right, thank you, Ben. I'll kick off the uh, Q&A session uh, with a question for you. you. You had mentioned during the presentation that it has been possible to some degree uh, previously to acquire time-resolved data. Could you repeat or, or clarify how specifically is, are the in-situ features on the continuum different from those previous time series acquisition uh, capabilities or uh, hacks that people have had to put together? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, a good question. So um, for EELS data, um, like, let me go back to my slide here, uh, like this data here, um, where I'm capturing a single spectra over time. This is something that was certainly possible uh, to collect eel spectra over time with, uh, the, with our older versions of software and with the quantum uh, GIF. You could do this using um, the time series spectrum imaging. Uh, but in in that uh, older software and with the quantum, you had to specify exactly how many spectra you wanted to acquire and at what interval. So I could say I want to acquire a thousand spectra um, with one spectrum every or or with ten spectra every second. Um, but uh, there was no way to to start the acquisition and continuously acquire data indefinitely. So that's one change. Uh, also, look back uh, is now available. So with uh, what we could do before, we would need to um, to start the eels acquisition first and then, start to apply whatever stimuli uh, we had planned and and uh, so that we would be sure to capture the onset of any dynamic behavior. Now we can be watching the spectrum for that dynamic behavior uh, and click record and have the onset captured because of look back. Um, and then finally, uh, with the old, acquisition mode, this time series uh, spectrum imaging, the speed was really limited. So you couldn't actually capture data at the, the highest speed of the spectrometer. Um, whereas now we can uh, capture in-situ EELS data as fast as we can uh, capture spectra in a, a a map, for example, and and the continuum is is of course even faster than the quantum, uh, so we can really capture this eels data with very high temporal resolution. Okay, thanks. Uh, another quick question, you, and you did address it uh, throughout the presentation, but just to summarize and, and clarify. What equipment do you need to use the features that you've shown? And is this available today? Yeah, um, great question. Let me go back to this uh, slide. So all of these features are um, broadly a part of the continuum. Uh, so you can, um, you can, purchase a system that does all of these things, uh, but some of them are optional. So all of this uh, in-situ uh, time-resolved acquisition 
is an option for Continuum. So that's that's the IS option. Um, counted acquisition is available if you have the K3 option for Continuum. Um, 40 STEM is available if you have the STEMX option. Uh, Momentum resolved eels is available if you have this Q slit option. Um, and then doing uh, simultaneous high speed acquisition of eels and EDS or or uh, or 40 stem and EDS is available uh, if you have this high speed EDS option. Um, and so uh, so yeah, with, with that caveat that there are these optional components. Um, everything in this presentation is uh, captured using the continuum and using the cameras uh, that are at the end of the continuum. Um, and all of it uh, is available today. Um, that's uh, one thing that um, I, I try to be careful about. I, I think well, okay, let me let me take that back slightly. Some of these features are going to be released with GMS 3.5. Um, so there are some things that you could have a continuum uh, system and not have this feature because it's a GMS 3.5 feature. Um, but you've already uh, you've already purchased everything that you need. So uh, these new GMS 3.5 features um, can just be upgraded uh, for free once GMS, once GMS 3.5 is uh, released. All right, and um, unless we see some more questions come in, uh, one final one, if you go a few slides forward where you show the features that are in situ enabled. Mm -hmm. there, there are clearly a lot of possibilities and uh, you didn't show data or analysis for all the different conditions. If somebody is considering adding in situ capability to their spectrometer, uh, what would they need to do to evaluate that performance to get a one-on-one -on -one demo, the possibility to send in a sample and work with you to collect data? Well, what are the options there? Yeah, um, I mean, if if you are interested in this capability, and uh, and you sort of, uh, I mean, it's one thing to see my data on my sample, but uh, it's totally different to see uh, the system collect data from your sample uh, and your experiment. Um, and we we can do demos of this system um, at at M and M this year. We did a number of live demos uh, where because we were doing so many that week, we we couldn't do uh, different samples. We were doing all the same sample, uh, but we did a number of of private demos for people during the week of M and M, and we can continue to do demos. Uh, we um, will have to schedule those uh, in advance uh, because we, we do have a very busy microscope at Gatan. Uh, but if you're interested in getting a demonstration of the uh, Continuum IS and the, these in situ features, uh, definitely contact us, contact uh, your local salesperson and they can uh, start the process of getting uh, a demo set up remotely. Uh, I also work remotely. So uh, so you can you can definitely have a remote demo even in these strange uh, days of the pandemic we're living in. So my my uh, email address is fairly simple. Uh, Benjamin.miller at amatech.com. Uh, so you can contact me directly. Um, or or uh, contact your salesperson and they can uh, get you in touch with me as well. All right. Well, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and conclude. We appreciate everybody taking time to attend the webinar and to learn about in situ uh, EOS features with the continuum in GMS 3.5. Please do reach out to us if you have questions or would like more information. Thanks again. Bye.